Good morning, City family. Uh, we gather together again to hear from God and His Word, so do grab your Bible uh, and open up to John chapter 9. Uh, just to say this morning, uh, I'm gonna, we're going to take a break to sing a song uh, in the middle of the message, uh, so partway through I'll introduce that next song that we'll sing. Uh, and also I'm planning to do our uh, prayer. Uh, we've not had it earlier in the service, and I'm going to be doing that at the end of um, uh, the sermon. Okay, so just so you know what's coming uh, and what to expect. So open up to John chapter 9, and I will pray for us as we begin. Gracious Father, we uh, rejoice uh, in the truth that you do not treat us as our sins deserve. We know all too well the ways in which we fall short, the ways in which we live for ourselves rather than for you. And so we pray that you would work, uh, that I pray that you'd work through me in spite of my own failings, in spite of um, yeah, being a, a uh, jar of clay, uh, that through me and through your word, the glory of Christ would shine, uh, that we would be fed from your word and that we would be light uh, in this dark world. So work amongst us now by your spirit, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I wonder if you've ever had the experience of um, looking for something that, that is uh, directly in front of you but not seeing it. Uh, maybe you're at the zoo with someone and you're looking in one of the enclosures and you're trying to see the animal and they see it and they're pointing you right where to see it uh, and you just can't see it. it you, you might actually literally be looking at it, uh, but you, you can't identify uh, the animal. Or maybe you're looking for your, your car keys or your phone or something and uh, you, you're you sort of call someone in to help. You say, can you help me find uh, my car keys? And they say, you mean the keys that are sat right in front of your face? <laughs> I've never had that experience, but uh, maybe some of you have. Right? You're looking at something, it's right in front of you, but you just can't see it. Or maybe it's with celebrities, you just don't recognize them. Right? I'll be the first to admit, I don't, I don't know uh, a lot of celebrities. So when we watch Celebrity Bake Off or something like that and people are on there, I usually yeah, don't know who they are. And um, so you'd probably be embarrassed if you were with me and some famous uh, musician walked by, I would be totally clueless or maybe some famous footballer. Well, I, I could look at them, I could see them, I could say there's a man or there's a woman and this is what they look like, but I wouldn't know who they are. I wouldn't be able to recognize them. I think there's lots of times in our lives when we see something or see someone and we just don't recognize them for who they are. Uh, and, and perhaps there's no person right in the whole of human history that has had that experience uh, so much as the person of Jesus, that people see him, he's right in front of them. Uh, we'll see in our passage today, he's, he's literally standing in front of these people and they just don't get him. They just don't see him. They, they just don't understand who he is. And so my prayer this morning as we look in John 9 is that we will see Jesus uh, for who he is. So we're going to go through this account in John 9 of the blind man, maybe one of the more familiar accounts in John's um, gospel record. Uh, and we're going to look at it in three acts. Uh, so if you think of maybe going to uh, a play, we have act one, act two, in Act 3. Okay, so we're going to look first at Act 1, which is the sign. Uh, we've been going through John's Gospel and Jesus is doing these miracles, these signs that authenticate and point to who he is. And here we see the sign. And in this sign, I want us to think about this, that Jesus intends to show God's work in you. Jesus intends to show God's work in you, just like he does here with this man. Uh, the event itself is easy enough to understand. Right? It was read for us earlier, Jesus uh, makes some mud, right? puts it on the guy's eyes, tells him, go and wash, uh, and he's healed. Uh, but I want us to dig in a little bit further, because you'll notice the question Jesus' disciples asked as they 
uh, stumble upon this man. I wonder what you would ask if we found this person when we get it the right way round. Because Jesus' disciples don't. They ask, verse 2, Rabbi, who sins, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Do you see what they're saying? Jesus, this man's blind, whose fault is it? His or his parents? Sounds very reminiscent of Job's counselors. Uh, if you're with us when we work through uh, the account of Job in the Old Testament, his friends came to him and they said, you, you're suffering, tell us how you've sinned. And so Jesus' disciples come across this guy who's been blind his whole life. And he said, they say, he's blind, who sinned? And we might think, uh, well, that's how people thought in Job's day. That's how people thought in Jesus' day. But people don't think like that nowadays. No, they, they do. It's, it's all around us. How many times have you been somewhere and something has happened and someone says, oh, that's karma. This person has done something and immediately there, there's some uh, reaction right, from the universe or something that they receive their karma. And we might think, well, that's... That's sort of Eastern mysticism. That's not Christianity. But I wonder, Christians can very easily think the same way. Because, and because of the events uh, of the last months uh, and the varied circumstances that we all find ourselves in, I want to camp out on this a little longer than I might otherwise. Uh, just this whole understanding of why this man was blind. We could pose it this way. What do you and I think of when we see someone suffering? Right, when we hear of someone who's contracted the coronavirus, or when we hear of someone who's lost their job, uh, or someone who's, who's just struggling to cope with life right now, right, do you think, oh, I wonder what they did to deserve this? What, what precautions did they not take? What poor decisions did they make? Uh, what fault is theirs that they find themselves in these circumstances? Why didn't they live in such a way that they could have avoided this? Right, and maybe there is the case that people are suffering as a direct result of, of sin, but that's not generally how suffering works in this broken world that we live in. I've no doubt that some of you watching this message will be in the midst of intense suffering right now. Maybe it's physical suffering, uh, maybe it's mental suffering, maybe it's emotional strain, maybe it's just the weight of the circumstances of life that you are just feel like you're drowning. And we can be tempted not just to accuse others for the suffering they find themselves in, but, but also to accuse ourselves in these moments. We think, I must have done something to deserve this. What have I done? And we sort of right, tear the room apart, looking everywhere, trying to find out what is it that I've done to deserve this. Again, suffering can work that way, but that's usually not how it works. There's other reasons uh, for your suffering and mine, as it was with the man born blind. Look back at verse 3. What does Jesus say? What is his answer to his disciples? It was not that this man sinned or that his parents sinned, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. Jesus says this man was born this way for the very purpose that God's works might be made manifest, might be displayed in and through him. So that the, the watching world can see who I am. Who Jesus is. Why was this guy blind? So that God might do something marvelous in him. And to show the world who his son Jesus truly is. This man is blind his entire life. And Jesus tells his disciples, this is why. This is the moment. This is the reason. So I wonder what, what situation you find yourself in. What, what are you having to endure? Uh, and, and to ask this question, what is God doing in you? What is God seeking to display through you? And, and we may not know the specifics, 
But we know this, that, that God intends to display his supernatural work by his spirit in your life to a watching world, a work that would magnify his son, the Lord Jesus, a work that would proclaim to the world right, that there is no one so good as the Lord Jesus. Right, that a Christian who trusts in their faithful Heavenly Father when they've lost their job, that God displays that work of faith and trust. That God displays the goodness of Jesus as a Christian holds to God's promise of resurrection when they've lost a loved one too early. Or a Christian who trusts the great physician with their illness, right, that he may or may not heal them now, but that ultimate healing is assured, that that steadfastness, that that faith displays to the world the value of Jesus. Or maybe a Christian who is weighed down by life's circumstances, who in spite of all that continues to walk by faith, clinging to the Lord, though they don't know when it will end. That they say, Jesus is enough. Jesus is all I need. Right? Or the Christian who, that's... Uh, when so much that this life has to offer is taken away from them, that they find contentment in the midst of need or want. Like God, God is displaying, and He intends to display these things through His children. And very often, the value of Jesus is displayed best, brightest, uh, through suffering. We see it here with this man, uh, and no doubt you, you see it in your own life, in the lives of your Christian brothers and sisters. And that's the way God displays his glory among us, through weakness, through suffering. And we'll see that preeminently as we come to the end of John's gospel account, as he displays that glory through his son in his death on the cross but that we as God's people clinging to Jesus our rock through all of life's storms show the world the work of God in us. Well, back to our blind man here. What, how does Jesus heal him? Well, dirt, spit, and washing. Dirt, spit, rinse, <laughs> repeat. Actually, you don't need to repeat it. Uh, Jesus makes some mud, cakes it on the guy's eyes, it says, go wash in the pool of Siloam, right? which that's the same pool, if you're with us in chapter 7, that the people were drawing water from, re reciting from Isaiah, uh, with, uh, we jo with joy we draw water from the wells of salvation. He sends this guy to the same place and says, wash off and see. And so ends Act 1 of this great account of Jesus with the sign, and we see that Jesus intends to show God's work in you and me. Well, before we look at scenes, uh, Acts 2 and 3, we're going to, to sing again. It's a song we learned a um, few weeks ago. And this is what the second, I think it's the second verse, it says this. Just as we think about God's purposes and suffering here, it says, Mine are tears in times of sorrow, darkness not yet understood, through the valley I must travel, where I see no earthly good. But mine is peace that flows from heaven, and the strength in times of need. I know my pain will not be wasted. Christ completes his work in me. We see him completing his work here, and no doubt he is completing his work in each of us. So let's sing this song together now, and then we'll pick up uh, the rest of this account in John 9. Okay, Act 1, the sign that God intends to complete his work, to show his work in you. Uh, that leads us rather abruptly into a series of interrogations, which is Act 2, the trial. And here we see that Satan intends to disrupt God's work in you. Uh, all of these interrogations of this man are meant 
to turn him away from the Lord Jesus. So let's see what happens. It begins in verses 8 to 12 with the guy's neighbors, uh, and they can't seem to agree. Is it really you? Is it someone else? And they don't know. So then he's carted off to the Pharisees. This is the, the religious law courts. Uh, and this is where the, the heat begins to turn up. Uh, the Pharisees are unhappy that this man was healed on the Sabbath. Verse 14, uh, now it was the Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. Uh, and we've seen Jesus heal on the Sabbath before. And I think he was doing it intentionally. Uh, but the Pharisees didn't like it. They felt that Jesus was breaking the law. They viewed both mixing of saliva with dirt, this, this mixing of mud, as well as healing as, as working, which is forbidden on the Sabbath day. And so in their books, Jesus was a lawbreaker. And initially, even the Pharisees are divided. Verse 16, some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God, for he doesn't keep the Sabbath. But others said, how can a man who is a sinner do such signs? And there was a division among them. So they aren't quite all on the same page. Uh, and so they asked the guy who was healed, verse 17, what do you say about him since he opened your eyes? What, what do you think? And he says, well, I think he's a prophet. And we won't necessarily think about it, but you can see a progression of the man's, I suppose, profession of faith uh, as he's interrogated repeatedly by this religious group. But they think, well, no, there must be another answer. He can't, uh, Jesus can't be a prophet because he's not keeping the Sabbath. So this guy must not have been blind. It must not have happened. So, so they ring in and, and bring the guy's parents in and they ask them two questions. Is this your son? And how was he healed? They say, yeah, this is our son, but he's old enough. You ask him the other one. And it tells us why they say this. It's because uh, they were scared uh, that they would be put out of the synagogue at the end of verse 22. Right? His parents said these things because they feared the Jews, for the Jews had already agreed that if anyone should confess Jesus to be the Christ, the Messiah, he was to be put out of the synagogue. And, and right, that's not just um, a, a physical removal, though it is that, but it's, it's being excommunicated from the religious community. Right? It's a huge loss. Your, your whole way of life would change. And it's no wonder they didn't want to be put out of the synagogue. And so they bring the man back, and the intimidation then spikes. Uh, we see this in verse 24. A second time they called the man who had been blind and said to, the, to him, and you can almost, right, they're intimidating him, and, and you can, it, it's quite ironic what they're saying, give glory to God, right? God, God is witness. Don't you dare lie. Right, this huge sort of robust council of people looking down on this guy. Don't you dare lie to God. Tell us the truth. Right, they're intimate. We, we know who Jesus is. You give us the answers we want. Right, they're, they're intimidating him and wanting to turn him from believing and trusting in the Lord Jesus. And so the man responds with the facts. Verse 25. Uh, whether he, Jesus, is a sinner, I don't know. One thing I do know, I was blind and now I see. Hey guys, this is what happened. So they ask him for a third time. How did this happen? And it's, it's interesting. Did you notice in the midst of all this, the Pharisees have no concern and they have no joy for the fact that this guy was healed. Someone who their entire life had never seen can now see and they aren't the least bit bothered or the least bit happy. They just say, tell us again, how did this happen? Have you ever told a story and, and people don't really seem that concerned um, with you as a person, just the detail of it? Right? It's, it's like someone saying that right, God used the, the cancer treatment they received to heal them. And really all they can focus on is, well, which arm did they give you a jab in? Or, or you know, just sort of this detail that is unimportant rather than to rejoice that you've been made well. The Pharisees didn't care about this guy. They weren't excited that he'd been healed. 
Uh, they weren't happy for his new sight. They just wanted to use him to get to Jesus. And so the guy seems to be on to them now. And so he decides to speak with um, some Yorkshire bluntness uh, in verses 30 and following. Uh, so verse 30, the man answered, why, this is an amazing thing. You don't know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes? We know that God does not listen to sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, God listens to him. Never since the beginning of the world, never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. Brilliant. Right, this guy gives it to him. The man was healed. Jesus did it. That says something about it. You can go back to the Old Testament and see repeatedly the promises of the coming Messiah that he would open the eyes of the blinds. And with that, uh, the interrogation ends and, and they kick him out. Verse 34. So that's the end of Act 2. Right? The, the man, he, is, he, he can't be turned from clinging to Jesus, and so they kick him out of the synagogue. But now we come to Act 3, and this is the verdict. And I've called the verdict, seeing is believing. Let me read for us again, verses 35 to the end. Uh, Jesus heard that they had cast him out, and having found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, uh, Who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? Jesus said to him, beautiful words, You have seen him, and it is he who is speaking to you. He said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. Jesus said, For judgment I came into this world, that those who do not see may see, and those who see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard these things and said to him, Are we also blind? Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would have no guilt. But now that you say, We see your guilt remains. Now, there's actually a few verdicts going on, being given in these verses. Uh, the first is the blind man's verdict. As Jesus seeks him out, we'll, we'll hear about the good shepherd in the next chapter. Jesus seeks him out. And he says, I'm the son of man. And the man who had been blind that now sees says, yes, I worship you, Jesus. I don't need the synagogue. It reminds me when I was in uni, there was a, a guy in our uh, university uh, church group who was from Japan, uh, from a, a, a religious home, not a Christian home, uh, became a Christian. Um, and his parents ended up disowning him because of his profession of faith. And I remember it was at his baptism. Um, it was striking that this guy stood up and he said, I don't have my parents, but I have Jesus. Right? He, that, that's this man here. He had Jesus. And if that was all he had, that was all he needed. And so this man believes. He, he, he doesn't just see the world around him. He sees Jesus and he believes. And he worships and calls him Lord. So that's his verdict. But we also see the verdict, really through the whole passage, of the Pharisees. They refuse to believe in Jesus. Right? It's not a, we need more information. It is a refusal. We will not. They ignore the signpost that is right, planted right in front of them, telling them who Jesus is. And they refuse to believe. And so what is, what is your verdict of who Jesus is? Where are you in the story? Who do you say Jesus is? Is your verdict like that of the Pharisees? I don't want him. I don't need him. Or is it like the man who was healed, that even if that's all I have, that's who I need? Now that's, that's the challenge this passage gives to us. Uh, but there's actually another verdict being given in the passage, and it's the verdict given by Jesus. Uh, and I would summarize it this way. Jesus says, if you are wrong about me, you are wrong about yourself. Right? If someone is wrong about Jesus, they are wrong about themselves. 
You see, the Pharisees, in their mistaking of Jesus' identity, they were mistaken about their own identity. They thought they could see. They thought they had sight. They thought they were well. They thought they were okay. They thought they didn't have any problem with sin or guilt. They thought that they could manage their relationship with God on their own. And Jesus' verdict to them right at the end, your guilt remains. You aren't okay. You you can't manage your relationship with God on your own. And if there's anything you and I have to get right, it is the identity of the Lord Jesus Christ. That he is the Son of Man, that he is the Christ, God's Messiah, sent to rescue his people from sin and death. And and that is what this passage is all about. And the reason isn't because Jesus needs us to vindicate him. But that unless we see him for who he really is, we're, we're doomed. Our guilt remains. We face judgment. This is all about who Jesus is, the promised deliverer who would come and give sight to the blind, who would release the captives, who would bring light into darkness, God's promised King and Redeemer. It wasn't the sin of the Pharisees that kept them from Jesus. It was their idea that they had no problem with sin that kept them from Jesus. It was their idea that they didn't think they needed help. Their idea that they thought they could see just fine. It was their trust in themselves and their own works that kept them from Jesus. It wasn't that they were too bad. And and we get this again and again and again in all the gospel accounts. Someone can't be too bad for Jesus. Those are the people he's come for. But sadly, we also see again and again and again There are people who think they are too good for Jesus and they don't need him. And the Pharisees here, their problem wasn't they were so bad. They had done all these horrible things and so Jesus excluded them. Their problem was they thought they were too good and that they didn't need Jesus. And so they refused him. They said, we won't have him. You see, it is only in believing in Jesus that we truly see, truly see him, truly see ourselves, truly see the world around us. And so the worst thing you or I could ever say is, I don't need him. I'm okay without him. Right? If, if you're a parent or you've probably seen this, some, some child trying to, to do some task. And it's clear they can't do it. Maybe they're trying to open a box and they can't get it opened. Or they're trying to, I don't know, cut some veg and they can't do it. And you think, let me help you. You you need help. Let me help you. And and you can see their stubbornness. Don't help me. Don't help me. I'm okay. And clearly they're never going to get there. And Jesus comes and he says, let me help you. Let me save you. Let me bring you out of darkness into light. Let me take you from death to life. And like these stubborn little kids, we slap his hand away and say, no, I don't want help. I'm okay. Right, and as we see Jesus and hear his interaction with this man and the Pharisees today, he is calling and appealing to you and to me. Let me help you. You have a problem with sin. You have a problem with guilt. You have a problem with your relationship with the living God. It's broken. You need that relationship healed, reconciled. You need your guilt and sin atoned for. And Jesus says, I'm the one who's come to deal with those things. I'm here for you. And and he offers himself to you today. And so I I would hope that any watching this wouldn't be like the Pharisees and say, I don't need him, I don't want him. But that like the man... You would say, even if he is all I have, that is what I need, the Lord Jesus Christ. And when you do see him, when you do worship him like this man here, you have a wonderful story to tell. Like the man in the story, you have a story too that says, I once was blind, but now I see. 
a wonderful story of grace, a wonderful story of forgiveness and rescue, a wonderful story about the good news of Jesus Christ.